Okay, so uh, welcome back from, from the little break. We're continuing our second day uh, with Dr. Masha Mileva. Uh, Masha Mileva is a specialist in modern Russian culture, stretching from the late 19th into the 20th century. Uh, she completed her PhD, uh, she took her PhD from the Courtauld Institute of Art, and since then she has been uh, teaching at many institutions, as per primarily the Courtauld Institute of Art and the University College London. Uh, she's active as a curator, and together with uh, Nikki Kozicharov, she is co-director of the Cambridge Courtauld Russian Art Centre. So, um, uh, Masha is going to speak to us uh, on, on the subject of on new systems in art, Karl Marx, Kazimir Malevich, and Heinrich Wölflin. So, welcome to Masha. Um, thank you very much, Vid. And um, I'm going to uh, start with couple of thank yous because uh, I have to say this is the most exciting and um, um, thought-provoking uh, conference that I have been to and certainly the most exciting in terms of its travel. Uh, I have never had to pull up my trousers and uh, jump into the water to uh, get into a conference, so this will stay with me uh, forever. And I'm really grateful to um, uh, Jeffrey, uh, who I feel that I have uh, somehow come uh, uh, in touch with through uh, meeting the family and friends. Um, and also always referring back to his work uh, in our conversations and to Karun. And I am looking forward to um, uh, talking to all of you again. So thank you very much. Um, and I'm going to um, talk to you uh, today about uh, quite an ambitious uh, subject uh, on um, Kazimir Malevich, but also Karl Marx and Heinrich Wolflin. I kind of threw in there because I think it uh, is a context which is very important um, uh, to consider the works uh, of um, Kazimir Malevich and the perception, um, our perception of his work and his own perception of his time and uh, painterly perception um, uh, in order to view this work. Um, so I'm going to start by, oh, wrong computer. Uh, by uh, with this work, which uh, Lika has already mentioned, White uh, on White, from uh, 1918. And um, it is uh, a work which is kind of most um, familiar uh, in terms of its um, uh, geometrical um, uh, elementary composition, uh, the focus on... Um, primary colors here. It is a uh, combination of uh, white uh, on white, uh, uh, a two geometrical shapes which uh, in their different uh, gradation of white and value create an infinite space, um, which is a suprematist space. And the way that um, Malevich uh, talks about it, white as the most pure color, um, and um, uh, suprem suprematism uh, was his aim to create uh, a uh, painterly system which is uh, supreme, absolute, and pure, and attains to a higher spiritual, um, I'll discuss that uh, to an extent, reality. So a different um, uh, reality which is also often discussed in terms of the fourth dimension, which Nikki uh, raised uh, yesterday, and uh, relates to a lot of um, Malevich's work and thinking, and his uh, philosophy relates a lot to um, contemporary scientific uh, inventions and um, also social upheaval. This is a work that is made in 1918, so the year after the um, Russian Revolution. So these are the sort of ideas that I'm interested in, and um, I will be uh, talking to you about um, uh, 
new systems in art, and I gave you a text uh, to read from 1919 uh, by Kazimir Malevich, which um, develops over uh, the 1920s and um, uh, can be uh, and is visualized in the set of 22 theoretical charts, which are um, pedagogical charts which were used um, for uh, teaching, but also for um, kind of charting and um, developing a um, narrative, a visual narrative for the uh, history of modern art from the 1880 to 1926. And it is a history which is very much driven by Malevich himself because it culminates in um, the development of suprematism. Uh, so this is um, therefore kind of looking to what I aim to do today is um, focus on the work of um, Kazimir Malevich in relation to um, development, uh, in relation to um, art and knowledge, and also the role of the artist in um, uh, in situating uh, his or her, in this context, his work in relation to um, um, art, existing art history, forms of scientific knowledge, but also uh, mysticism, spiritualism, um, but also, very importantly, the social context of uh, production, and in this case, uh, Soviet Russia. And this work more broadly is drawn from my own interest in um, historiography and uh, the writing of um, uh, and rewriting of uh, histories after the October Revolution and uh, specifically uh, the impact of um, uh, Marxism and Marxist Leninism as a methodology which was applied across disciplines to both art, um, science, um, and literature, and uh, so on. So it is um, uh, uh, also um, in in um, in terms of my interest. It is um, here. Uh, what comes into question is the relationship of uh, Russian art and um, the uh, and its dialogue with European modern movements. So, how did Kazimir Malevich um, uh, fit and situate, um, and also more broadly, Soviet art history and Russian art history, uh, see the development of Russian modern art? Um, uh, in relation to um, uh, European developments, and it it can't really be um, discussed without it. So, um, therefore, I'm interested uh, in looking at Malevich's. Uh, there he is, um, Malevich's. Um, Worldview or his way of seeing, and um, how this worldview or uh, painterly perception that um, is embodied in his work, such as White on White, um, was impacted by the October Revolution. And um, uh, this is a uh, book on the left, the cover of a book by Malevich, which was uh, published uh, at the Bauhaus uh, in 1927, which is called uh, uh, um, The World of Non-Objectivity, which is kind of culminates um, a culmination of a lot of uh, his theoretical writing, which he was developing from um, 1915 um, uh, onwards. And um, uh, this is kind of the ideas that I will be um, discussing. So um, very um, briefly to say that uh, Malevich um, was um, uh, uh, 
he was born in uh, uh, 1879, and uh, he was born to Polish parents in um, Ukraine. Um, so therefore, his kind of nationality is um, often debated and discussed. Uh, but for our um, in, in terms of our interests and what we've been discussing already, is um, his parents were Catholic. Um, and however, uh, he wasn't a um, um, uh, practicing believer. However, he was extremely interested in uh, religion and the relationship between uh, religion, society, and art. And he, um, this is his early works from um, 1908 and 1910, his symbolist period, where uh, the shroud or the representation of um, Christ um, where uh, Malevich does refer back to um, uh, religious uh, symbolism as subject matter and um, um, also was um, uh, using a fresco um, uh, painting uh, for um, a lot of these works, which is actually, there is an excellent, excellent essay in a book that Nikki um, uh, co-edited that um, you have the introduction to, uh, that I really strongly recommend you to go and look at. So this is Malevich uh, in his earlier period and kind of going to talk about um, uh, the spiritual uh, in his understanding of the spiritual. Uh, this is Malevich's, um, just to say, uh, I've already mentioned his, uh, back, um, his uh, Ukrainian um, background, Polish and Ukrainian. This is uh, from his archive, uh, Ukrainian Peasants Dancing, and uh, himself in kind of a Tolst uh, Tolstoyan uh, shirt in Kursk in 1900 and uh, where folk uh, art and um, were, uh, was extremely important to, uh, for the development of uh, his work. And um, he was uh, 38 years old at the time of the revolution. I think it's always quite good to kind of uh, date uh, the uh, age of the artists we're looking at at kind of key events like this. So uh, the Black Square, which is probably um, the um, work which is uh, the most familiar to all of you, would, you would have heard about it. Um, it, uh, it is, um, of course, kind of it defines uh, suprematism in terms of its um, um, the economy of pictorial means um, um, of pure art, which I've talked about, um, black on white, uh, the ideas of space, uh, time. Here we have the uh, quadra a, a quadrilateral plane, um, which is depicted, uh, so not an exact square, depicted on a white background. And um, it relates to kind of a higher spiritual order, the zero of um, form, as he called it, and the face of new art, um, the first step of pure creation and art. And this is an interesting quotation that I've included here on the slide uh, from uh, 1927 uh, in a letter to a uh, fellow artist where he says, the world as a sensation beyond the image of an idea is the content of art. The square is not an image, just as a switch or a plug is not the electro el electric current. Those who thought it possible to reveal an image or who saw an image in an icon or other representation were mistaken, for they mistook the switch or the plug for the image of the current. So it is very interesting to kind of um, uh, to refer back to uh, his own writing on how he um, conceptualized um, um, the black square and not um, uh, uh, and it's um, not as an icon as it's often been called, and uh, we, um, let me just have it uh, here in, uh, this is the 
painted in 1915. It is displayed in the corner of um, the um, room dedicated to Kazimir Malevich at an exhibition called 0 0.10, the last futurist exhibition of painting. And it is um, placed in the top right corner um, uh, where traditionally an icon would um, be placed. Um, but going back to um, uh, his own words, it is very important for um, um, Malevich the idea that the world as a sensation beyond the image. So it relates to um, these ideas of the fourth dimension, but also the uh, significance of the uh, perception of the artist, which is um, impacted by the particular social context that he comes from. And this is why um, this idea of an additional element or um, kind of zeitgeist of the time relating to Wolfland is um, important. Um, so when writing, um, uh, at the same time of, as this exhibition, um, when suprematism was launched, um, it's also interesting to see that um, Kazimir Malevich curates this space, so very much as um, the geometrical objects are um, uh, curated or um, uh, placed in a composition uh, within, um, it, or on a white background in his paintings. You can try to think of uh, the exhibition wall or the, the wall of um, the gallery as a suprematist kind of in infinite space where the works themselves create a particular uh, composition. And uh, at the same time, he uh, published uh, uh, this um, brochure, which is called "From Cubism to Future, uh, From Cubism and Futurism to Suprematism: New Painterly Realism." And this is where it's interesting, kind of, to relate it back to Mondrian. Although, of course, uh, the thing that they're kind of um, there were similarities be between them, but there were also kind of very important differences. But this idea of of um, uh, creating a, a new system uh, in art which um, follows through complete reduction in terms of uh, geometry and representation, uh, but claims towards uh, to a new painterly realism where the focus is purely on um, paint and um, texture and uh, surface. So um, these are some of the ideas I guess we could uh, refer back to. But it also, why this, why this booklet is important and why, why, why I'm raising it, is this um, Malevich beginning to uh, situate himself in relation to existing um, art trends and kind of creating a self-lineage and genealogy. Um, so suprematism uh, derives from cubism and futurism and leads to suprematism. And this is very much traces his um, own uh, de artistic development. This is an early work, um, 1902 or three, which shows his um, interest in impressionism. Um, uh, also interest in fauvism. Um, uh, for example, um, of course, the, I think the uh, bather uh, that you see on the right bears a very strong um, resemblance and uh, important relationship to Matisse's dance, uh, which was commissioned by a uh, private uh, textile merchant uh, for uh, the Moscow home. Uh, and this is an, an exhibition of a, an installation before the First World War of the um, Picasso cubist uh, room in his house. And this is really where, in terms of, um, one can talk about the relationship between Russia and the West at the, t at the start of the 20th century a lot, but the presence of these works in Moscow for, um, uh, as kind of, um, first-hand first experiences for artists were very important, especially for Kazimir Malevich, 
who, unlike other artists, such as Tatlin, for example, never left Russia until 1927 when he traveled um, to Germany. So the, uh, it was works that were brought to Moscow on exhibitions, but also reproduced in journals. And also when we, I'll be showing you some of uh, images uh, of um, the, the, those uh, pedagogical charts, uh, this is also the, um, uh, in, uh, it, analytical study of cubism and fauvism and uh, impressionism, he goes back to these images as a source. So it was a very important source and this is something that is also of interest to me is how in the 1920s, in the case of Malevich but also other artists, the history not only of Russian art but also Western art uh, is being rewritten from uh, the Marxist uh, context. So uh, this is, uh, goes back to um, uh, Malevich's development, just to give you an idea of uh, his uh, futurist period, uh, the knife grinder, which is in the Yale uh, collection in New Haven. Um, and uh, his um, kind of is a very, as you can see, quite a radical shift uh, to uh, painterly realism of a boy with a knapsack, color masses in the fourth dimension. So this idea of quotation of particular scientific and philosophical uh, mystical ideas, uh, Piotr Uspensky is the one who was writing about the fourth dimension, is um, uh, evident in the titles themselves. Um, and I won't go into this uh, very much because I'm concerned about the time. What time am I meant to finish? Okay, great, okay, super. So uh, this is something else um, where I think, as well as uh, scientific and math mathematical and uh, technological developments, um, developments in, um, or ideas and uh, experiments in language, and uh, Malevich's uh, relation, um, dialogue with uh, and participation in Russian futurism was very important. This is a, a sketch from 1915 um, called Allergism um, 29, or thank you, um, Village, and um, gives you an, an idea of the role of signs and um, also semiotics or the, the, uh, in, in his work. And uh, he says, so we have that, um, uh, the black square, which he always uses, and he does a lot of sketches for his uh, suprematist uh, compositions in general. But here he says, it just says in Cyrillic village, uh, and I quote from the slide, the village, uh, instead of painting huts and corners of nature, it is better to write the village, and uh, in it everybody emerges with more particular details, encompassing the entire village, end quote. So it, it is interesting, kind of, the advances that um, uh, um, Malevich makes in um, experimenting not only with uh, pure geometrical forms, scientific and uh, philosophical ideas, but also um, uh, play on words, but also signs uh, within, and kind of that con the idea of concepts as signs uh, for representation. Um, so um, these are kind of ideas that are happening before the Russian Revolution and after the Russian Revolution. It is interesting to see how uh, the same black square that um, we've just looked at uh, in quite a lot of detail um, becomes something else. And this is where um, the, um, it is important um, in terms of my own methods and approaches to look at the context of uh, production and um, to consider the kind of social upheavals and uh, understand how uh, suprematism, but also modern art, was uh, reframed and reassessed and represented in relation to Marxist uh, dialectics as well, and also to the reality of um, what was happening in uh, Soviet Russia at the time. So after the Russian Revolution, Kazimir Malevich is invited to um, come to Vitebsk, where he uh, begins uh, teaching. And uh, at this point, he already has a group called Supr Sup 
Priamos, where he has a kind of a following of, of um, uh, individuals and students, and uh, teaching becomes a very important part of his uh, thinking and development of his ideas. And he focuses very much on teaching and writing. And um, uh, it, interestingly, in terms of when we were talking about the future uh, and Bonnard and the future and whether he thought about it, Malevich thought very much about the future. And specifically, he thought about his role in that future art history and his legacy. Um, and um, But this is where I think we can kind of uh, go back and uh, under, uh, look at, uh, this is a photograph of uh, Kazimir Malevich is uh, in uh, this, amongst the group of students. This is him uh, before a blackboard. You could, uh, Unavis is a uh, name for a group uh, that was formed in uh, the People's Art School in Vitebsk, where Chagall was the uh, first director. And um, he was very much pushed out by Kazimir Malevich when he arrived there. And UNIVIS is an acronym. We love acronyms in Soviet Russia and now. Um, and it stands for um, uh, Affirmers of New Art. So there is this whole focus of um, uh, on uh, new, on the new, and we can see that this idea of um, the black square as an icon, or this idea of kind of sensa uh, the sensations uh, that he was talking about, electricity that he was talking about before, here becomes a brand for a um, artist group, and they're wearing these. Um, black square on their sleeves, which uh, shows that they are part of uh, this collective. So this is where suprematism is no longer a kind of one-man creation, it becomes a collective creation. And after the revolution, we have a complete um, kind of uh, reframing of the um, hierarchy of um, the value system of art, where the artist um, is replaced by a collective, and um, uh, a lot of the uh, works which were produced in uh, Vitebsk are no longer signed, for example, and uh, which is also interesting, and um, it um, also the sole patron becomes the state, and um, the uh, uh, artist moves out of kind of an artist studio into these very important cultural state-funded institutions um, where, um, again, we've got to reframe the idea of who is the art made for. And the art is no longer made for an individual, it is made for the people, and the people meaning here in the Soviet context for the masses. So we have, this as you can see, kind of experiment going on. This is their brand name with Univis at the back, 1921. So um, we have the black square here uh, leaving uh, quite already kind of a radical, almost kind of sacrilegious space, if you think about it, on the top right corner of the room as we had the black square, and actually leaving the walls of a building into the streets. So. Um, we again have um, the Malevich here holding uh, a ceramic plate with the black square. Um, the stu this is um, uh, here El Lisitsky, who is a very important uh, um, art artist working at the time, but also a follower of um, Malevich at the time. And um, we have uh, the black square here on a uh, fabric. And this is a design by uh, Suyetin, another um, student of Malevich's, which says, Hail Univis, and it is the, um, um, used as decoration for a train carriage. So here, and I think this is where it's interesting kind of to go back to, and maybe we can, if we want to talk about this in discussion, I'm not going to go into this in detail, but the idea, the relationship between aesthetics and utilitarian form, and between kind of um, the role of the pictorial and aesthetic, as Malevich discusses it on page one of the text, um, in relation to uh, the focus which was on utilitarian production after the revolution. And he says uh, in the first um, 
sentence, no utilitarian form is created without the help of aesthetic action, which sees everything except the utilitarian as pictorial. Um, so this is kind of the ideas where I think it's very important to go back to his own writing, and Malevich actually, um, um, the, the, uh, his kind of list of writings, is, it doesn't fall short of um, uh, quantity. There's a lot of uh, writing, theoretical writing. A lot of it uh, is quite hard to make sense of. Um, but uh, he definitely felt the need to express himself. And, um, and this is, I think, where in relation to... Um, uh, um, new systems of knowledge, we've got to uh, go back and reread uh, uh, his own um, uh, philosophy and theoretical writings. So uh, this is just uh, another photograph of the um, Univis room at an exhibition in St. Petersburg where it's, um, I'm just adding it to, to uh, show how uh, Malevich uh, himself staged his art. And I think that's another interesting way to think in terms of um, suprematism in space, but also uh, ways of seeing and to go back to the way that it was uh, seen in um, and staged and displayed in the 1920s. And the works were displayed with no names and uh, no titles, uh, which is uh, also goes back to this idea of the collective. And uh, just one quotation that uh, Elisitsky talks, um, uh, describes Univis in a lecture in Berlin uh, in 1922, um, and he says that Univis is an intermediate space between the studio and the factory that is the transition stage from subjective subjective to universal design. So it's interesting to think about this idea of um, uh, not only aesthetics and utility, but also about a studio labor laboratory factory. And factory, of course, very important in uh, Soviet Russia in uh, the uh, surge or kind of the, the need to rebuild economy. And uh, once Stalin comes to power, we have the a uh, five-year plan that focuses on industrialization, collectivization, and the building of economy. So um, this is the sh showing suprematism leaving, uh, becoming a living art form, and um, um, where the, uh, um, again here, unnamed um, uh, collective uh, works are being used to decorate uh, buildings, for festivals, uh, um, and interesting to think in relation to Mondrian as well, uh, and um, trams and uh, so on. So this is actually the cover of the text that I um, uh, sent to you, which is on new systems uh, in art, uh, published by uh, Malevich in Vitebsk in 1919. And uh, this was a very... Uh, kind of fruitful period for his writing. This is um, uh, another one which is called 34 Drawings, Suprematism, published in Univis in 1920, and another text which is God is not cast down, art, um, church, and factory. So a lot of these texts were uh, actually published and written as pedagogical manuals. And this is where, in terms of art and knowledge, it's, I think it's very interesting to think about the role of uh, the uh, educational um, center of the school, the art school, in formulating and developing new systems of um, knowledge. And uh, just um, another image of how the black square was used. Uh, this is Malevich uh, in, um, lying in wake um, uh, after his death, where the black square is just above his um, uh, bed, which is itself kind of a suprematist um, uh, block, and the black square, which was used on his grave uh, stone too, and on his grave. Uh, here. So very briefly, just to show you some of these images, because I'm aware I'm running out of time, but also these images are very hard to read. So in uh, Univis at Vitebsk, 
um, Malevich began to really think about how do we teach contemporary art um, and what are the significant moments in contemporary art, not only for teaching but also for the development of future new systems uh, in art. And this is one of the diagrams which I'm absolutely fascinated uh, by, which uh, kind of looks like a, I mean, I don't know, we can discuss what it looks like, kind of a, uh, a jetting stream of, I uh, guess, some kind of organic, uh, with the squiggly forms, uh, which uh, these ones actually relate to, this is a Rochinka, this is, um, this one I think is, no, this Tatlin is like a, um, a block which is being wedged, and this is the trajectory of suprematism over time. So it's interesting to see how um, the role of the diagram in uh, trying to uh, also visualize um, artistic development and uh, knowledge. And this is um, uh, another uh, diagram from these 22 pedagogical charts that I started with, and um, which um, Kazimir Malevich takes with him uh, to Berlin for, for his, his only time that he traveled abroad. He was invited to um, participate uh, uh, at the uh, uh, big German art exhibition in Berlin uh, with a uh, retrospective of his work. And he took a lot of his um, writings, but also um, sketches and uh, paintings with him for this exhibition. And, um, he uh, also took these um, pedagogical charts. So it's interesting to see how he really wanted for the Western audience to um, not only look at uh, his work uh, um, in terms of um, understand it in relation maybe to you know, international constructivism at the time, but to be able to situate it in his own uh, theoretical, philosophical thinking. So this is um, historical development of new painting, 1880 to 1926. It starts from um, uh, the bottom, naturalism, then um, uh, impressionism, Cezanism. Cezanne has its own ism, and even in this writing, Cezanne is very important. Then it has uh, five stages of cubism, uh, futurism, and suprematism. And these are the, the different uh, painterly styles that um, Kazimir Malevich um, did, um, in, together with his students, conducted um, uh, formal analysis, and not only formal analysis, but also tried to situate it in relation to its um, uh, kind of social context. So here, we, he kind of visualizes and traces the development between 1880 and 1926, not as a linear, uh, and this is again in, in the text, he kind of defies artistic progress. So this is something where the development of contemporary uh, art or modern art is in flux. It's something that um, moves not only in the forward direction, but uh, up and down, and there is a great interrelationship. Um, in terms of um, Marxism, uh, but also the kind of the very famous um, on the right is an image of Cubism and Abstract Art, which is a um, MoMA uh, exhibition cover from 1926, which really uh, does um, has determined the way that we see modern art or modernism. Um, and on the left is a um, Marxist uh, history of uh, contemporary European art from 1926, which uses a very similar um, uh, kind of diagram in order to uh, trace the kind of linear development of the various um, uh, European, uh, both literary and artistic developments by a Hungarian emigre artist who came to uh, Soviet Russia after the failed uh, Hungarian revolution. Uh, and this is 10 years before um, uh, Alfred H. Barr. But this is my favorite one. Uh, it looks at the social origins of new art and literature on um, is, the, is, is the diagram. And it uh, situates the various um, artistic developments, such as constructivism, futurism, Dadaism, um, between the to, uh, the top tier is the material strength of society, and then the bottom, the psychological strength of society. So, for example, we have 
um, futurism, which is kind of, uh, what are those, um, that game that used to play where it goes ping pong, ping pong, ping pong. Where, Palms. sorry? Palms. Yeah, yeah, all of, yes, but you, yes. Yeah. Anyway, so it's just like that, where <laughs> futurism <laughs> is suspended between private property, steam, then ricochets to machine aesthetic and utopian socialism. So there's kind of very important interrelationships between them. So I'm trying to kind of situate this, um, so this idea for uh, kind of investigation um, and um, charting investigation and scientific um, uh, investigation of the various developments became very important. And this is where Kazimir Malevich fits into this broader uh, kind of uh, milieu of what is happening where the focus becomes on um, science and scienti having scientific, ideological and Marxist investigation, which he does. And this is him with his students in front of these works. Um, and this, um, these uh, charts were produced in um, 19, uh, uh, 20, between 1924 and 1926 at the State Institute of Artistic Culture, which was a museum, then turned into an institute. Uh, so this relationship between uh, museum and educational center becomes very important. He was a head of the formal theoretical department, but they also had an ideological department, which ensured that uh, a kind of the methodology, the Marxist methodology was present and was there. So these are the charts, and I'm not going to go into them uh, in great detail, but just to say that this is a, a very interesting uh, in 22 charts with German uh, uh, subtitles because they were intended for, they're, they're the only ones that survive for a German audience. And not only do they conduct very careful formal investigation of painterly perception of artists in order to isolate what Malevich calls the additional element. And here, the additional element in terms of uh, cubism is this um, sickle, uh, that this, uh, the sickle form uh, element uh, that is conducted through uh, very careful sketching uh, and study that the students conducted in isolation of various works that he set aside for them. Um, then we have, um, let me just go ahead. So this is a close up in terms of both the study of color uh, and form. Um, the two stages of cubism. Um, then uh, Cezanne had like this fibrous element and suprematism just had a line. Um, and this was, all, it wasn't finished. I won't go into this, but just to say the way that he talked about it is in terms of bacteriological investigation. So you can actually think of these as kind of resembling laboratory investigation and uh, bacterial um, microscope studies. Uh, this is something to um, show how this, some of his work was done in, labor in this kind of laboratory format, kind of looks like a laboratory. Um, I won't go into these, but I kind of, we thought of these when we were looking at the, um, at Jeffrey's work at the start. <coughs> um, and um, yes, so this is just to end here is that uh, this is the table of graphical formulae of the additional elements. And this is, you can see that it's not finished. And in the same way that uh, the um, uh, Mendeleev table uh, of uh, elements is not finished, this is kind of a work in progress. And the, the only ones that were um, done is for um, cubism um, and Cezanism and suprematism. And um, he conducts kind of very ongoing studies of also the social context. But he had the painterly perception of the environment. And this is where I think Wolflin, uh, Heinrich Wolflin is important. Um, these images are uh, interesting to consider. So I'm going to finish uh, there because I'm, I think I've taken a bit too long. But I hope that I've given you uh, some ideas to think about and we can uh, have a conversation Thank you.
thank you, Masha. As before, we're going to start with some questions from the students, if there are any questions. Yeah, um, well, David, you go first, and then Emma. Because um, they're, they're naive in the, in the foundation of them. When did, like, when did the icon of the hammer and sickle, when was that uh, conventionalized? Was that as early as the October Revolution? Yeah. <laughs> I looked at the microphone and I was like, <gasps> um, I d Alan, Alan, do you know? <laughs> Do you know about the hammer and sickle? I know that it was. Um, is it a Stalinist as, image or was no, it? No, 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 no. no, no. It predates, it but I don't know October how. Revolution? I don't know how. Well, the hammer Bosch and sickle relates to the uh, propaganda around the alliance between peasants and workers. This is what which, I'm getting uh, at. Which was adopted as the emblem, emblem so, of the Soviet but it, Union. It, so the, but the, the iconographic symbolism it does go. Back to, the, but we have. I know that we have a colleague who looked into it, but I don't. Mm -hmm. See, my my question involves the concern with everyone's familiar with the iconographic intimations of the hammer and sickle, and yet you showed one slide where you referred to um, suprematism in action or something. It showed a series of of suprematist images uh, posted on the outside of a building. Oh yeah. And I I couldn't help. But be immediately, what came to my mind is these one. The, yeah, that one on the bottom left is the hammer and sickle image, and I'm wondering if outside of its iconographic intimations, if any of this art informed its construction, because it, it seems aesthetically to remind me of these shapes and symbols. Um, informed the construction of the symbol of the hammer. Yeah, I mean, I, it pre, I mean the hammer and sickle um, predates. predates the idea, as you say, the unity between the work and peasant, and um, there was a lot, a lot of that um, is part of the propaganda imagery uh, in posters. But what is, um, I think, interesting here is um, how um, non-objective art, and the world of non-objectivity that Kazimir Malevich develops in suprematism, um, is a very uh, powerful tool to convey kind of ideological propaganda messages. And I don't have uh, the very famous image, I don't know if some of you might have seen, of Alisitsky's Beat the uh, Whites with a Red Wedge, uh, which um, is very... Um, uh, and it, it, here, uh, and not on the image that you see on the bottom left, which doesn't include any uh, lettering, but uh, often you have very simple geometrical shapes to convey the idea with text, and text was very important for the purposes of propaganda. And you know, the question, or the, the the big debate in the 1920s is what is the most, you know, what should proletarian what should, what should and will proletarian art look like? Because it is the first proletarian state in the world. And the debates in the 1920s is that it could be non-objective or it could be realist. And um, But suprematism, in terms of its legacy, and um, does uh, retain um, a very strong foothold in design. And you have uh, Suyetin who uh, is one of their colleagues and previously students of Kazimir Malevich, who, des who designed the, um, this image here, um, and also worked in uh, porcelain ceramics, was also the designer uh, of the interior of the Soviet pavilion at the 1937 Paris Exposition. So it's, um, yes, I think that, I don't know if it fully answers your question, but... I don't know if my question was fully a question. Okay. <laughs> oh, uh, Emma. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, my question relates to what seemed to be a bit of a tension between the collective and the individual, in the, especially in relation to how um, the artwork was displayed without any information or titles or... Um, the artist's names, um, but then Malevich seems to have a very clear vision of his specific role in 
the shaping of the future. So maybe you could just speak a bit more to that. Yeah. Um, he was, um, and I guess it's where it goes back to Mondrian, this idea of um, the artist as uh, having a mission or being a visionary. Uh, he did perceive himself as a genius and um, as a leader. And uh, he, um, so, and I think that, um, so I think that it is a very, um, the tension is present there and it's very difficult, I think, especially in the post-revolutionary period. But, um, and this is where Malevich uh, occupies the, uh, the position of a, um, educator uh, and as a um, instructor uh, in a teaching institution. However, in these exhibitions in the 1920s, what's important is that his work wasn't named either. So it was work that was created by the Univis Collective. And although he did have uh, one-man exhibitions like the one in Berlin, but also the one in Russia, in Soviet Russia uh, in the late 1920s, and he had kind of so th there was a focus on the artist. Nevertheless, I think it is also, um, and he did see himself as a very important uh, in formulating these ideas as the author of suprematism. Um, but he did try to kind of resituate um, himself as an individual after the revolution. Yeah. Yeah, Brian. Uh, thank you. This is fascinating for me. It's so all a new area. Um, what I'm intrigued with, is, and and would ask if you could could um, maybe enlighten uh, me in this, is in the Marxist conception of history, which is very teleological, and then when you start to look at at Malevich's classifications. Is that also teleological, and how does that relate to the whole pedagogic aspect? Mm -hmm. um, and te can you um, define teleological? Yes, in, yeah. in the sense that this is this is a movement of history towards yeah. an end point. Mm. Uh, that is the achievement of yeah. all of what's come before it, yeah. and a sense that that then, while that might shift, it it it's almost like it goes horiz uh, horizontally mm. as opposed to vertically. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I think that. I mean, in that way, I think suprematism is seen as that end goal, which everything leads towards. In um, in the idea of in Marx's conception of it leading towards communism, so um, I think that um, that is the way that, and I think that I would see uh, his own relationship to it in the way that he um, would uh, situate his uh, narrative in relation to. Um, Marxist methodology at the time, but his quotation of Marxist methodology is quite superficial, um, and uh, he re he is interested in kind of the context of production, but he is not talking about um, the um, uh, the um, whether it is. Um, the background of the artist, whether it is, uh, and that he's not talking about the class struggle. He's, it, it's very much a formal analysis, and it, but it is concerned with um, where I think it's more concerned with Heinrich Wilflin and kind of the um, ideas of Zeitgeist and um, um, th as opposed to Marxism in that way. But he tried to kind of adopt his thinking in relation to what was happening at the time. Levi, and then we'll go to Lika. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think you've 
kind of touched on this question already, but I'm curious how much the focus of Malovich or the suprematist movement was in uh, creating public space to allow the public to participate in the new system, not so much in uh, exhibitions, but more so as like, institutions for artists to participate. And then how much these institutions or public spaces were aligned with uh, ideology, Marxist ideology. And I'm thinking about these uh, public spaces in relation to, uh, I guess, more contemporary movements around art and as a social function of creating place for mm -hmm. the public, yeah. Um, I, I, it's a very um, interesting question. And um, I guess my first thought would be to say that with the uh, art school, um, in Vitebsk and the art collective. Um, the uh, art school was commissioned uh, to produce works for festivals, for example. So it is where the, art, the students and artists are participating in um, um, kind of social production from the moment of them entering the uh, art school and um, also the um, artists were responsible for creating museums of contemporary art um, where they were themselves purchased works by contemporary artists and their friends in that way but to what extent um, they brought again that's kind of defeats the idea or kind of by putting works of art into museums, it takes them away from the people. Um, however, in t of kind of the idea of taking uh, the streets, um, as Mojkowski said, the streets are our brushes and the squares are our um, um, canvases, palettes. So um, I think that um, the spaces that were um, created would be, uh, so the idea of social commission was very important and the, the way to um, uh, engage in that would be to be part of an institution. Um, and uh, it is also the, the way that uh, you would be able to display your work through um, state exhibitions and uh, so on. So yeah. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Masha. I, I'm always fascinated when seeing a picture of the black square painting mm -hmm. that it's not really black and that mm -hmm. it has these gradations of color. And well, I guess over time it formed a lot of crackle and, and things like that. So um, my question is about the materiality of mm -hmm. the, the painting. This one particular in relation to what you show here um, in its use on on fabric or on on the um, the coffin of Malevich, and so the reproduction of the um, of that painting, actually. So, mm -hmm. uh, to what extent does Malevich really care about the materiality of his paintings, or does mm -hmm. he create these paintings in order for to have them reproduced in different materials, mm -hmm. and and is the um, the form more important than the materiality of the painting itself? Very good question. And I think that, um, well, first of all, what I would say is that um, he himself reproduces and repaints some of his earlier works in the later 1920s period. So he goes back um, and paints work kind of in, uh, earlier works of the Impressionist phase in order to fit into this genealogy that he created. So therefore, and and predates the work. So he dates it as like, you know, 1910 or whatever, 1905. So um, I think that for him, um, the, uh, and also of the black square, there were four, four versions of the black square that exist now. Um, and I think that in terms of the materiality of the paint, the crackling, there was actually painting that was an, uh, um, the one that we see here. There was a painting that was underneath uh, this that he painted over. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a 
they recently um, uh, did an infrared infrared um, study of it, and it's and it, and I can't remember what it was. Um, it was a racist joke or something. Yeah, it was about. Um, yeah, it was a, but I mean, <coughs> we won't go into the kind of what it said, but the idea that he was repaint them and also something else that is interesting about this period is that a lot of the artists were experimenting with um, uh, paints as well and um, the, uh, and materials and um, the, um, there was a great short, I mean, this is 1915, but in 1920s there was a great shortage of materials and, um, uh, you know, Klutzis is one of the artists, or Lisitsky was interested in um, sand and cement and incorporating into their works. But I think that for, in terms of answering your question, it is, um, for him it was, what was more important was the kind of legacy and the brand. Alan? Uh, first of all, really fascinating topic you're taking on here in terms of uh, Malevich's positioning of himself in the Soviet period, you know, after the consolidation of the dictatorship and everything. And uh, I come back to uh, his first political point of origin, which is anarchism, his involvement in the anarchist movement at that pivotal period in 1918-19. He's publishing it. And, and, his statements in Anarchia, and um, and also in an intense dialogue with Rodchenko and others over mm -hmm. the politics of art in relation to the politics of anarchism. Uh, and Nina Goranova, of course, argues that Malevich, um, in his uh, aspirations towards a hegemony, mm -hmm. a hege hegemonic claim around supremacist aesthetics, in uh, as embodying the revolution, in a sense, betrays his anarchist politics. And certainly that's a, that's a point when, in which there's a falling out. I was much amused by that chart you gave with Rodchenko uh, yeah. <laughs> dropping off, because in 1919 there's a, a face-off between Alexander Rodchenko presenting his version of anar anarchist, anarchism in art, emanating out of Max Stirner's philosophy, and uh, Malevich and uh, Rachenko exhibits a series of black on black paintings as a reply to Malevich's mm -hmm. white on to white. white. Yeah, but um, getting to uh, to uh, your your project, I mean, he's negotiating such a fraught landscape in terms mm -hmm. of who's going to come out on top, who's going to make that claim successfully uh, to embody the revolution mm -hmm. through their in their aesthetics. And this reading that you provided us, he's still articulating what reads to me to be an anarchist politics. Mm. And I'm interested in how he might reconcile things like smash with revolution the cages of nationalities, fatherlands, and nations with the Soviet project, or, um, or is the destruction of military culture and the organization of a single human state or non-state uh, you know, a transition yeah. beyond state power when, of course, in the 20s, it's all about consolidating the socialist state. Mm. I, very, very uh, good point, and thank you for the close reading of the text. And um, as uh, I was not, I was not joking when I was saying that I reread it also in the last couple of day, <laughs> days closely, uh, as well as rereading. Um, this text, um, uh, so the one on the right is called God is Not Cast Down, um, Art, um, Church and Factory. And, um, and that is 19, it's in my um, 1920, anyway, it's, I can't remember the... 1922. 1922. So reading that, it made me think in terms of again, his anarchist kind of early beginnings after the Bolshevik Revolution, because he finishes the text by saying that God is not cast down. He relates it to um, factory, and he says that, uh, you know, it kind of defies progress against uh, some similar ideas there. But 
Um, and I don't know if you read that, if you have read this text um, or not, but I can, I can send it to you. But it's, um, it, it shows, it compares the kind of, it's very anti-institution and anti-institution of the church. However, um, and he compares it, the church to the factory. So he's both criticizing the factory and the church and finishes the text by saying that God is not cast down, which is in 1922 is quite a... Sorry, I'm going to have to... Yeah, okay. okay, we can talk later. Yeah. yeah. Um. So, yes, anarchist. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and just to say that in the early 1920s, it was possible to have a, a, a degree of freedom of expression. Mm -hmm. 